For those that are visiting for the first time today, we've been studying the book of Luke since the 1st of February. And we've, we've gone on a long journey to be able to understand our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in a much better way. And yet in so many ways, today is going to be the crowning highlight of the book. A book that was written to bring us certainty about our faith. A book that was written to a man named Theophilus, who we understand was a literary device. Simply meaning in Greek, a friend of God. And prayerfully today, we are the friends of God gathered to hear God's word. Are you with me here? Now in the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote... The period of time between the resurrection and the ascension was 40 days. And yet, here in the book of Luke, we're going to find that Luke compresses those 40 days into one day. And you say, well, why does he do that? Well, we get a little inkling if we remember back to Luke chapter 1. You remember when Zechariah couldn't speak? Because he lacked faith. And then John the Baptist was born. And he was able to speak again and say that his name would be John. Well, then he broke out in song. And in the middle of his song, we find this said by Zechariah, the priest, in Luke 1, verse 76. And you, my child, he's talking about John the Baptist, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way of him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on all those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Well, right here, he talks about the fact that John the Baptist would prepare the way for Jesus. And he talks about that in verse 78. He says, And the mercy of God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. He says, From heaven, a new day will dawn. And so Luke compresses this new day. The day of Jesus' resurrecting and those 40 days before his ascension into heaven, as one day. And so the title of our lesson is simply Resurrection Day. Let's get to chapter 24. It breaks up very, very easily. Luke made it easy for me this morning. Verses 1 through 12, we'll be talking about the morning of wonder. Verses 13 through 35, point 2 will be the afternoon of burning hearts. And our third point, verses 36 through 49, the evening of hope. And then we have a few leftover verses we're simply calling the epilogue. (laughs) Resurrection day. The morning of wonder. Verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they prepared and went to the tomb. Now, very interesting right here. We see this theme coming. He says... On the first day of the week. Very early. Literally in Greek, it means deep dawn. You know, for those of us that get up right before the sun really shines, we know what deep dawn is all about. It's still kind of dark, but you see the edge of the sun creeping up over the horizon. And hopefully you're doing that with your quiet times. Amen, guys? He says, on the first day of the week, At deep dawn, the women took the spices they prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find the body of Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how I told you how he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and all the others with them who had told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. 
Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of lemon lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. The morning of wonder. The women wondered. And Peter wondered. They were surprised, perplexed, confused, and sad. But bottom line, mystified. We find from the record of Mark that when the women went to the tomb, they were quite worried about whether or not they were going to be able to move the large stone that blocked the tomb of Jesus back in the first century. They built many tombs with a a disc, a stone disc covering that had a channel that you could roll the stone down, much like we have a closet that moves down the channel. And the women said, man, this is such a gargantuan stone, we don't know whether or not we can even move it. And back in the first century then, it would have hidden probably a rectangular opening into the rock itself. They get there, and the Bible says, They found the stone rolled away, and the tomb was empty. And this is what is this all about? Suddenly, two men come. And the Bible says their clothes were like lightning. I mean, this is better than tide or anything. You know what I'm talking about right here? I mean, we're talking lightning. And, of course, we understand that these are angels. Now, for a lot of us, we think angels are these really good-looking women with long, flowing hair, with no complexion problems, and just long, flowing robes. Sadly, those are not angels of the Bible. The angels of the Bible are men. And the Bible says, these guys, you don't mess around with them. One angel in the book of Isaiah wiped out Sinatra's army in one night of 185,000 men. Boom! That's just one angel. Think what two could do. Let me tell you something. When you see these guys in dazzling white and they come to you, you'd be like the women. Time to hit the ground. (laughs) And they say to the women, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you why he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered. Well, what, what did Jesus say exactly? Go back to Luke 9, 22. This is before the journey section. So he's referring to this. And Jesus said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus lays it out, does he not? Wow. And so the angels preach the word. You say, why two angels? Fairly simply answered. We understand that in God's plan of truth, there was always a double witness to confirm the truth. Deuteronomy chapter 19. And so God was saying, it is the truth. I'm sending two messengers to confirm he is risen. Just as he predicted. The son of man, of course, referenced back as we've looked many times into Daniel chapter 7. As Jesus takes the throne. Beside the Ancient of Days. And we see right here, the inference by Luke is, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. Well, who did that? God. To be crucified. Who allowed that? God. And on the third day, be raised again. Who did that? God. See, he's laying out that all these things that look so disastrous to so many people was in fact by divine design. It was the plan of God. And Jesus prophesied. God has been in control of all of these horrific events. And now 
his plan was coming to fruition. They were fired up. We understand very simply right here. Why did the women not believe? Because they forgot the scriptures. Well, they're so excited once they believed. They go on back. They tell the 11 and all the others that are gathered with them. And a special note, we find that Mary Magdalene is the first person to meet the risen Lord. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, are the ones that report this back to the apostles. And now we begin to see the great faith of the apostles in in verse 11. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Whoa. Not a real flattering picture of the guys that are supposed to be the cranking preachers of the future. But you know, that adds, in my mind, a lot of realism to it. It's kind of interesting right here. The actual Greek of the word nonsense is hapix legomen, which means, taking it from Josephus in, in, in context right here, delirious talk of very sick people. So when the women come, they go, delirious talk of very sick people. And of course, you, 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 I'm sure there's a, a hint of chauvinism right here is the guy's going, just like women, you know. But in fact, the women later would go, just like guys to doubt us, amen? Well, you know, Peter, something struck Peter. He gets up, he runs. He too sees the stone's been rolled. He goes into the tomb and then he notices something that's blow away. The grave clothes have been set aside. Oh my goodness, could it be? And he wondered. You know, it occurs to me that we of the 21st century have very little respect for the Word of God. It's why we're such a faithless generation. It explains why even those who call themselves Christians cannot get up early enough before work to be able to spend time with the Word of God. I suspect if God would come to you in the form of a voice, maybe you'd get up earlier. I mean, if you're sitting there at your couch at quiet time, you go, This is the Lord. This morning will be Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So don't worry. Thank you, God. (laughs) But it is the very voice of God. And why do we struggle? Because we lack faith. We don't even remember the word. How bad can it get? You can drift away to the point where you even forget your commitment, where you said Jesus is Lord. You know, I don't know about you, though. I've been pretty pumped by the restorations of late. I mean, Mike DeVille, Laura Kimborowitz, Steve Paul. I mean, they were awesome restorations. Amen, guys? These people had left the Lord, but they came on back. And then today, with Tao and Heather, that was cranking. Amen? And and, and what it is, I mean, I I don't know, but you could see it. But did you see? You you may not have noticed it. But did did you see that Tao was a little fired up? (laughs) It might have gone by you. He has such a mundane personality. (laughs) Even Heather. When Tracy cried, she cried. You see, when you remember the word of the Lord, it becomes something sacred again. What if you were to read the word of the Lord And you really, I mean, just just for example, and you really believed it was God speaking to you every morning. 
his voice. And he said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things begin to go, do you think it would change your day if you remembered it through the day? Love those who hate you. Do you think that would change the way you drive? (laughs) For some, sadly enough, it might even change your marriage. I don't know. I'm just suggesting that if you remember the word of God, it would change your life and you'd be fired up about it. You see, if you're only wondering, then you don't yet believe. See, wondering if it's really true equals it being a bunch of nonsense. But you know something? For Mike and Laura and Tao and Heather, they're telling you, Jesus is Lord. The word of God is inspired and inerrant. I blew it. I sinned. I know the wickedness of the world and praise God. God, in his mercy, he's received me back, and God's people have received me back. Truly, it was a morning of wonder. Let's move to the afternoon. The afternoon of burning hearts. Verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a road called Amanus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Now, the question has to come right here. Who are these people? We find later on in the text, as a matter of fact, verse 18, we're introduced to one of them. His name is Cleopas. It's referred that the two were actually at the meeting where the three women came back and reported, hey, the stone's been rolled away. The tomb is empty. The angels have said, he is risen. They were there. Now, they're heading on back to their house in Imanus. And on their way back, they're talking about the meeting. And this dude comes on up to him. Turned out to be Jesus. They didn't recognize him. Well, we have a couple of mysteries right here. First, who's the second person? I think the second person is most likely his wife. You say, why? Well, read down to verse 29. This is later on. But they urgently urged Jesus, stay with us. For it's nearly evening, the day is almost over, so he went in to stay with them. Now, truth be known, there are five or six different theories about who this person is, and none of them is completely compelling. But the wife seems appropriate. Secondly, why didn't they recognize Jesus? One thought is, God supernaturally blocked them being able to see it, and that's a, that's a possibility. I don't know if that's true. I think sometimes we can get so sad, so down, and see a person out of context, context that we don't even recognize who they, who they really are. I was on the plane just a few months ago. I'm sitting there, and in walks this lady. And she goes, Kim! And I'm going... <laughs> I'm going through my files. Have you ever, had, have you ever gone through your files? And I went back through them, all the Christians you ever knew in your life, all the people that didn't like you, all the people that, you know, I'm I'm going through all these different files. Hey! (laughs) Now, at church, you can be saved by saying, hey, sis, how you doing? And, you know, you know how you try to fake it? And and there is no fake in it. (laughs) She goes... You don't recognize me, do you? No, I don't. No, I don't. No, I'm just going it. She was having so much fun. Well, she was out of context. Plain. Boyfriend. Hat. 
takes off the hat. Boyfriend steps aside. Oh, it's Olivia's tennis coach that she had for three years and ate at our house all the time. So I do think there's a possibility that given their lack of faith, given the just total hurt and misery, this is a possibility that it wasn't simply a supernatural blocking of the recognition. But in fact, it was just so out of context to think that Jesus was risen. We move on. He asked them the question, what are you discussing as you walk along? Verse 17. And they stood still. It just blew their, they just couldn't even speak. Their just faces went downcast. Verse 18. One of them named Cleopas asked, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? And, and you don't know the things that have happened there these days? What things? <laughs> About Jesus of Nazareth, he replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers, our rulers, our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. Boy, you feel the pain, the shattered dream. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They, they went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find the body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb, found it just as the women said, but they didn't see him. Wow, that's a lot of faith. You know, right here, the dialogue most likely Luke got firsthand from Cleopas, who probably becomes a powerful disciple. There's hope for us all. <laughs> but in it, we see that faith is destroyed not only by not remembering the scriptures, but when dreams are shattered. When things don't turn out as you thought they should. This is a faith stealer. How many people have had their faith stolen by things that have happened inside of their family. How many people have had their faith stolen when their dreams for a certain college or a certain profession didn't become realized? Or even a relationship that they had banked on doesn't happen. Or even worse, there's a loss of somebody that you love more than any other human in the world. Or maybe you just didn't figure that you wouldn't be that healthy. It wasn't in your plan. It's a faith stealer. And though these people care deeply about Jesus, they, they had no faith because their dreams were shattered. And yet here they understood the gospel. I mean, it's interesting, you got to admit. I mean, they outlined it all. It's the third day. Well, the third day for the Jew was always helpful. I mean, it was on the third day that Abraham arrives at Mount Moriah ready to sacrifice Isaac. It was the third day that Esther says, okay, I'm ready to go in and see King Xerxes. It was the third day that Jonah gets caught down the fish. I mean, the third day has always been a sign of hope for the Jew. And they say it's the third day. They understood that the stone was rolled away, the tomb was empty, and that the angels, but they just blew it off. Eh, it wasn't real angels, just a vision. It was the women. <laughs> that nonsense. What's Jesus say? Verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Whew, baby, that's a rebuke. Now, remember, they think this is just a stranger. Here's this dude. They're shattered in their faith. They're walking back to their house. And th th this guy that doesn't know anything now starts rebuking them. What is wrong with you two? How foolish. 
foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? You see, the Jew had no place for a suffering Messiah. They were looking for a David, a champion, a commander of thousands. As David threw out the Philistines, the Messiah, the Christ, would throw off the Romans. They had no room for a suffering Messiah. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he began to explain to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Well, what, what would he have said? Well, we get a glimpse of what he said by looking at some of the, the sermons in the book of Acts. We only have time for a quick one. Turn to Acts chapter 3. He says in verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. Verse 17, now brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold them through all the prophets, saying that the Christ would suffer. Repent then. And turn to God so that his Christ, so that your sins will be wiped out. That the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Christ who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until he comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from amongst your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from amongst his people. So here is the prophecy of Moses. It's taken quite clearly from Deuteronomy chapter 18. And he says, there's going to be somebody just like me. So now we see that God in his wisdom, had Moses come, and now Jesus is the new Moses, taking his people to the promised land. Amen, guys? So he goes all the way through the Old Testament scriptures, giving people faith. But it just wasn't the Messiah they expected. Let's get back to Luke chapter 24. Verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. While we see him, it's Jesus. Where'd he go? They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Now, we're going to talk about the glorified Christ in a moment. But right here, the two go, man, that conversation with Jesus was, didn't you feel your heart burning when he opened the scriptures? I know exactly what these guys are talking about. I remember when I got sat down after church one Sunday and a guy named Jim Walker opened up the scriptures to Acts chapter 2 and laid out to me, Mr. Religious, what it took to be saved. He laid out, you got to have faith. You got to repent. You got to be a disciple. And you got to get baptized to have your sins forgiven to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Man, I just, I felt burning. I mean, I was burning all the way up. You ever felt that burning? Because, I mean, you hear scripture and, I mean, you're, you're saying, oh, I don't believe it. No, 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 no. And you're going, oh, my gosh. I mean, the scriptures are so powerful. I remember another time, as a fairly young Christian, I'd, I'd fallen in love with this awesome sister, Elena. <laughs> And I was discipled by the minister at the church, a guy named Chuck. And we had our time together on Fridays. 
And I, I, I called Chuck up and I said, you know, Chuck, I've, I've got some stuff that's really come on up. Because Elaine had asked me to go to take her to the airport. But I, I was unsure whether that'd be cool or not spend all that time. And I go, Chuck, I just think I, I can't come for the D time today. I've got some other things, some really important stuff's really come on up. <laughs> he goes, okay, bro, fine. Next Friday, I come on in. He said, bro, I missed last week with you. I says, yeah, you know, I just had stuff to do. <laughs> he says, well, funny thing, Kip. Last Friday, I saw you driving with Elena one direction while we were going down the other direction. And then we went over to 1 John chapter 1. Oh, baby. I felt my heart burn. This is what he read. Chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message you've heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. He said, Kip, he says, you know, the only thing that makes our relationship special is that it's based on truth. The moment you lie, oh, the moment you deceive, you destroy our relationship. I just was, I, I mean, it was, I, I left there, I was nauseous. Have you ever just been that taken aback? I mean, has your heart burned all the way down to there? It's because it's the truth. I just broke down crying because I knew I had shattered something very special. And Chuck was good enough to forgive me and all those good things, but I wonder, in our relationship with each other, are we just kind of giving our thoughts, or are we breaking open the Word of God and saying, you know something, my brother? See, a lot of times, we, we understand the call of God to make disciples of one another, to call each other to obey the Scriptures. But you know something, if you're just telling people, it, it's not going to impact. You've got to get the word of God out there. Is that's what's happening in your due time? You're talking about the word of God? You're using the word of God? See, you may be frustrated. I can't believe the person I'm trying to disciple never changes. Get the word of God out. I'm so frustrated by this person. I'm pulling out my hair. Get the word of God out. Let God do the work. Are you with me right here? And you see, what the Word of God does, it not only convicts, but it heals. It heals by repentance. And though we all perhaps see things in a way that are different than what they really are, we have our own reality. When bitterness comes into our lives, we have our own glasses on and we see things differently than they really are. We have a reality. But you know something? This brings us back to the truth and the real reality as God sees it. Are you with me right here? Let's keep going. Back to Luke here. Remember, Jesus has just disappeared. Their hearts are burning. This is verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They're fired up. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together saying, It's true! The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two who had told what happened on the way and how Jesus had recognized them when he had broke bread. So anyway, they get so fired up, they go back to Jerusalem. They find the 11 and the group that's with them. And the 11 goes, Peter saw the Lord. He's risen. And they go, we saw the Lord. He's risen. Now the way that Luke writes this is very awesome. The two people that met him on the road to Amonis is a witness, according to scriptures. It is the truth. But now we have the witness of Peter as one witness, and the witness of the people from Amanus as a witness, and so we have a double, double right here, and you thought that in and out was the only people that served it. You see, a double, double is a double witness right here. 
the two on the road to Emmaus and Peter and the couple as they preach that Jesus is risen. Are you with me right here? You see, they were excited. You see, it showed that Christianity was different than any other religion, any other philosophy. They now believed that anything was possible. You see, you look in the tomb of Buddha and you'll see his bones. You look in the tomb of Mohammed and you'll see his bones. You look in the tomb of Confucius and you'll see his bones. You even look in the tomb of Abraham, the father of faith, and you'll see his bones. You look in the tomb of Jesus and it's empty and all possibilities are possible with a God that does the impossible. Are you with me right here? No wonder their hearts were burning. There could be new life. Turn, 1 Corinthians 15. Interesting little side note here. Paul writes, Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you're saved. If you hold firmly the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to Scripture, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. So even Paul notes there's a special appearance to Peter. Is that cool or not? After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of whom were still living, though some have fallen asleep. Some have died. Then he appeared to James. That's the half-brother of Jesus. And then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared also to me as the one abnormally born. I find this kind of interesting. Right here, Paul talks about Peter and the twelve as some of the first people to see Jesus. But some of the last people to see Jesus is James and the apostles. The word apostle right here is used in a little bit broader context than most of us are used to. Most likely, the apostles were the 72 that were commissioned. Apostle just simply means messenger. And we'll see how that comes together in just a moment. You know, we need to understand that the scriptures will change our life. They'll burn our hearts. They'll take away that crusty hardness that we get. And we then can dream again, believing that anything is possible if God raises the dead. Let's go to the evening of hope. So remember, they're all fired up at this meeting. Verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you, oh baby. <laughs> then they were startled and frightened, thinking he was a ghost. Now you got to understand it. Jesus leaves the, two, two, the couple there at Imanus, disappears right after they identify him. And now everybody's believing there in the community of believers which is, I believe, the same community of believers that Luke details in Acts chapter 1, the 120, the 11 faithful, the family of Jesus who all became disciples, amen guys, the women who followed Jesus, and the 72. That's the 120. That's this group right here. And all of a sudden, boom! Hey guys, peace. Whoa! I mean, they believed, but now they really believed. And that was Luke's point in his whole book. He says, I'm writing these things, Theophilus, so you may be certain of your faith. He's standing there. He gives them a very comforting greeting. Peace be with you. And then he asks two questions. Verse 38. He said, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me and see a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you have seen. 
When he'd said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it. And the press is out. This is the second dinner Jesus has been at. I guess the glorified body, you can eat as much as you want, and you don't gain weight or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Let's look at the glorified body. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> here Jesus pops in, pops there, eats everything. On the other hand, you know, he's showing them his hands, his feet, the scars. And so we read this explanation in verse 35, chapter 15. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. Perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men of one kind of flesh, animals another, birds another, fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, the splendor of earthly bodies another. The sun is one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and stars differ from stars in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that's sown perishable, it will be raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it will be raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it will be raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. <clears throat> right here, very clearly, we understand that the resurrected body is a lot different than the natural body here on earth. And it talks about a body of glory. Now, glory in the scriptures always has a connotation of the splendor that comes from being with God. And so we understand that there is a likeness, if you will, to how we were here on earth. At least Jesus' body at that time had the likeness of the scars. He had the scars on the hands and the feet. At the same time, he had the ability to go here and go there because he was no longer bound by time and circumstances. And so Jesus was in his glorified body. There was a physical sense of it. He could eat. But on the other hand, this was not the same body. In order to get this glorified body, Paul says, you have to die. And then, you get a cranking new body. And you see, that's the difference that we have as disciples. We have the hope of eternal life. Amen. When it comes right down to it, either Jesus resurrected from the dead or he didn't. If you believed he resurrected from the dead, then you believe his words, which promise that you too will be resurrected from the dead with a body just like his. And that can get you excited. Because otherwise, you're going to be rotting the ground and maggots are going to eat you. And to dust, you will return. Those are your two choices. I'm going with glorified body. <laughs> Let's move on. Verse 44. He said this to them. This is why I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what was written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Right here, we find that now the disciples believe and they are now operating with a belief that all things are possible, they're expecting miracles to happen. You know, one of the things that I think is going to be challenging for all of us in the next few months and years is the financial crisis that's coming on in America. And I see it to be absolutely controlled by God. It's coming. You're not going to stop it. And there's no place you're going to be able to hide your money that it's not going to be hit. Now, as a disciple, we can stay cool, calm, and collected. Well, for some of us, because we have no money. Amen. <laughs> but we understand 
that, 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 that when the hand of God comes down, particularly financially on a nation, it's the judgment of a nation. And it's the humbling of a nation. And it's going to make people go, God, I need some help. It's going to make them more open. Amen, guys? But it's, things are not always going to turn out the way you want. I think about the challenges that the Klopex had. They, they lead the church in Phoenix. They wanted to go full time after the Sullivans went down to Santiago. They had this house. They had two houses. And if you ever had to have two house payments, oh boy, the second one is crushing. And they gave a deadline at the end of August that unless they could sell this house, it was going to go into foreclosure and they'd have to just take all the penalties that go with it, particularly the hit to their credit. Well, sure enough, August 23rd, it sells and they're praising Jesus. What was extra awesome is they gave him cash. That was awesome. <laughs> On the other hand, the Hardings, they equally had a crushing house payment. But sadly, their house went into foreclosure. What? Did God not like the Hardings? No. God just handled that a different way. The beautiful thing, I think, with the Hardings is they, they haven't let it hit their faith. And they go, well, God is in control. In a way, this is awesome because, well, okay, so it's foreclosure. We're going to be bankrupt. But that means, well, we don't owe anything. And so now we're free to go into the ministry since we have no debt. And so we're very excited to announce that the Hardings are going to be taking over the leadership of the Portland International Christian Church and going in to the full-time ministry. You see, God, God works out. God works out things, but maybe not in the way that we think. But if we have an understanding of the miraculous, we can trust God. <laughs> in this last section, it's very interesting. Once they believe, Jesus is okay. Here's the plan. Starting in Jerusalem, you take this message to all nations. It was a simple plan. That was God's plan all the way along. That's why all the things that happened in the Old Testament. That's why the suffering Messiah. That's why the crucified Jesus. And that's why the resurrected Lord. It was so the message of salvation would go from Jerusalem to all nations. And you see, when you're excited about your faith, you're going to tell everybody. Wasn't it awesome last week when Eddie got baptized? Yeah. And back here, he had a whole clump of all of his friends from high school. Why? He was flat pumped up about the Lord. You know, it was really kind of cool. You know, remember when we sent out the mission team to, to Honolulu? You had the 10 up here. They were all fired up, a little scared, but fired up. You know, it's been exciting. They, they went there, and those 10 disciples joined the little remnant group. In the three months they've been there, they've had 10 additions, six baptisms. They're supposed to have five baptisms next week. Is that awesome? God is moving in a great way when you're excited. Also today, New York has their first baptism, the New York church. Is that exciting? God is moving. Well, you know, here's our chance. Next week is bring your neighbor day. My question is, do you believe in the resurrected Jesus? If you believe in the resurrected Jesus, you are flat going to bring as many friends, as many families, as many strangers as you could possibly bring. Because you want them. To have what you have. Unless you've forgotten. Unless your dreams were shattered. But if you believe, then you're going to want to go to Jerusalem and to all nations so they can hear the message. I really do hope and pray, guys, next week we blow it out for Bring Your Neighbor Day. Minimally. Let's all have a visitor with us. Amen, church? Yeah. Let's get to the epilogue right here. Let's go. Come on, Verse 50. We saw the morning of wonder, the afternoon of burning hearts, the evening of hope, and now the epilogue. Verse 50. When he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. 
Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. You know, right here at the very end, Jesus gives a blessing. And any important occasion, there always is a kind of a, 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 a benediction, if you will. And he blesses the disciples as he leaves. He's taken up to heaven. And what do we find in the very last verse? Almost exactly the same picture we saw in the first verses of the book of Luke. Luke brought us in chapter 1 to the temple. To the people of God that were praising him. But at that point, they were the Jews. Now we come back to the temple where God meets man. And what do we find? The believers praising God continually. You know, in some respects, I look at this, and it says, man, he kind of ended abruptly. Almost like, you know, some of those shows you see, well, to be continued. <laughs> well, that's exactly what he was thinking. You see, he continues the story in what we call the book of Acts. But this was enough to write. What was Luke's goal for Theophilus? What was Luke's goal for the friend of God? What was Luke's goal for you and me? To believe with certainty. To understand the incredibleness of Jesus and his word. You know, someone once said, Yesterday is history. Tomorrow, a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Your present from God is your life. There are two questions he has for you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, resurrected from the dead? And what is your good confession? Now and to all nations. God bless.